Good morning. What a great crowd. So uh, those of you that heard me talk yesterday about technology may get to see it tested today on me. They have about three different technological devices up here that I'm going to try to monitor and run while I speak. We'll see if I can do that. Good thing it's early in the morning. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk to you about water resources management. And I'm not here to scare you, although you may be scared when you leave. I'm not crying wolf because I've actually seen the wolf. But I am going to shine some light on a subject that we all need to know more about. Water resources management, what is it? It's the activity of planning, developing, distributing, and managing the optimum use of water resources. This is the definition of water resources management, and the word wastewater does not appear, but it is there. Lakes, rivers, oceans, aquifers, rain, and even wastewater is all one water. We can't make water, and we can't get rid of water, but we certainly can absolutely manage water. This is a hydrologic cycle that we're all, I hope, familiar with. Water lives somewhere in this cycle, in the ocean, in the lakes, in the streams, in the cloud, in the soil moisture, in the rain. Somewhere in this cycle is where water lives. And whether it's stormwater, groundwater, recycled water, potable water, or wastewater, it's all one water. And this is what our industry, our industry, needs to realize, that this is all one water. Water is an interesting thing. It can be your best friend by quenching your thirst on a real hot day, providing some fun in the sun, or making a place where you can catch that big one. I did that last summer. He was six pounds off the Florida record, just a little bit bigger. But it can also be your worst enemy. Flooding homes. This picture here is a picture of the Old River Control Project. <clears throat> this is where the Army Corps of Engineers went to war with water on the Mississippi River, constructing the billion dollar Old River Control Structure 300 miles north of New Orleans. This real marvel of modern civil engineering has for 50 years done what many thought was impossible, impose man's will on the Mississippi River. It turns out there's a better way to the Gulf of Mexico, 150 miles shorter and 15 feet steeper. The old river control structure is the only thing keeping the Mississippi River from merging with the Atchafalaya River, making Morgan City the new New Orleans. I like Mark Twain's quote from his book, Life on the Mississippi. 10,000 river commissions with the minds of the world at their back cannot tame that lawless stream, cannot curb it or define it, cannot say it to it, go here or go there and make it obey cannot save a shore which it has sentenced, cannot bar its path with an obstruction which it will not tear down, dance over, and laugh at. 
Mother Nature will finally have her way. <clears throat> this is the Oroville Reservoir. This is the second largest reservoir in California and one of the keystone facilities within the California State Water Project. This is north of Sacramento, probably 30 to 50 miles, and uh, one of several reservoirs in that area that supplies water as far south as Southern California. They move water around in California a lot. This is what the lake looked like just over one year ago. And this is what the lake looked like just over one month ago. You remember seeing this on the news where the, you can see where the um, spillway is taking the water. And uh, remember they had a problem with the spillway right here that they didn't realize until the water started going over the spillway, which it hadn't done for years and years. <clears throat> now they have a problem and the water even uh, breached this, um, this sod spillway here, this earthen spillway. Anytime water breaches an earthen spillway, people get pretty nervous. They evacuated 200,000 people, if you remember, on the news. And uh, they were afraid that that spillway was going to fail. <clears throat> well, that is little print there. <clears throat> So this is the before and after pictures of Lake Oroville. Here in Texas, your Toledo Bend Reservoir is, last Friday when I checked, 91% full, 4.492 million acre feet, the largest man-made body of water in Texas. An acre foot is about 326,000 gallons of water, so there's a lot of water there. And Toledo Bend, <clears throat> Amistad Reservoir is 81% full, 3.160 million cubic feet. The Sam Rayburn Reservoir, 95% full, 2.857 million acre feet. And Lake Livingston at 100% full, 1.785 million acre feet. These are all things that we can see. It's easy to witness these things. It's easy to drive by these lakes and see how full they are. Something that is just as challenging is happening in a place that we can't see. We are depleting our aquifers at an alarming rate. While Texas is experiencing a time when reservoirs are full, it's easy to overlook the unseen. Texas is the home to nine major aquifers. Managing water is a very difficult endeavor. Who is the best to manage water? The federal government? No. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> the state government? Maybe. Texas Water Development Board, maybe. Groundwater Conservation Districts, probably. Uh, there are currently 99 groundwater conservation districts in Texas. Uh, I spoke with Brian Anderson, who is the water level program supervisor at the Texas Water Development Board, and he told me that the conservation districts work with varying degrees of success. And uh, I know what he's talking about. Um, near my home in Kansas City, in western Kansas, we have the same issues that you have here in Texas, especially in the High Plains, and that is water depletion, aquifer depletion. And, uh, and we have up there also uh, these groundwater conservation districts. And we find the ones that work the best have two things going for them. One, they're having to drill much, much deeper for water. And two, they educate the members of the district. When the members of the district realize that they're running out of water, they start complying more with their own rules.
There's only one sure manager of our water on earth, and that's Mother Nature. She will change the course of a river when she sees fit. She will require wells to be drilled deeper and deeper as we deplete our aquifers. And in due time, I think she will take back her floodplains. Yeah, it's easy to overlook the big picture when all of the 196 major Texas reservoirs combined are at 85% capacity. And that was as of last Friday. You have 196 major reservoirs in Texas, and they are at 85% capacity. But again, the reservoirs we can see aren't the issue. It's what we can't see that lives below ground <clears throat> that is the issue. And that acts like unmanaged high blood pressure that's slowly killing you without any announcements. How much water do we have? Well, as we learned at a very young age, 70, roughly, 70% 70 of the earth is covered with water. But here's something you might not know. 97% of that water is salt water. Of the 3% of fresh water that's left, 2% is ice in glaciers and ice caps. And here, to me, is the most surprising news. Of that 1% that we can use, 0.98% is groundwater or aquifers. Only two one-hundredths of a percent is in lakes and streams. So it's false security when you see your reservoirs at 85% capacity. We should be looking below ground to see what condition we're in. In 10 years, the Colorado River Basin has lost the equivalent of two Lake Meads, the largest reservoir in the United States. This is Lake Mead with Las Vegas in the background on the top picture. And uh, the bottom picture is, um, is the, sorry to say, the typical bathtub ring that we have seen on Lake Mead now for years, uh, showing where the water used to be and has not been for many, many years. The Las Vegas Water Authority gets their water from Lake Mead. They have two intakes um, at different elevations under the water and the higher elevated intake is dangerously close to being exposed. The Colorado River Basin supplies water to 40 million people in seven states and it's losing water at a dramatic rate. Most of these losses are groundwater. A satellite study from the University of California, Irvine and NASA indicates that the Colorado River Basin lost 15.6 cubic miles of water from 2004 to 2013. That's twice the amount of water stored in Lake Mead. James Falmagetti, a NASA scientist and study co-author, wrote that groundwater made up 75% of the loss in the basin. This GRACE project, the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, was launched about eight years ago by NASA uh, and expected to have a five-year life. These two satellites are still sending back data, uh, so that's pretty great. Um, one satellite trails the other one by 137 miles, and they have a way, a very precise way of measuring gravity on Earth, and as the first satellite travels over something that has more gravitational pull, it triangulates with the other satellite and they can now look and tell below surface how much water there is. So we can accurately measure with the GRACE project what kind of water we, we really have in our aquifers. So we're not guessing anymore. It's not just the western United States that is experiencing this aquifer depletion. In Nassau and Suffolk counties, Long Island, New York, water pumped for domestic supply is used and sent to a wastewater treatment plant. 
The water is then discharged into the surrounding saltwater salt water bodies. As a result of these actions, the water table has been lowered. The base flow of streams has been reduced or in some cases even eliminated. The length of perennial streams has been decreased. And here is one of the worst things, saline groundwater has moved inland. So in that case, we're not only depleting our aquifers, we're contaminating them with brackish and saline water. There are many other locations on the Atlantic coast that are experiencing groundwater depletion in the Ipswich River Basin in Massachusetts. Surface, waters flow, surface water flows have been reduced because of groundwater pumping. Salt water intrusion is occurring in coastal counties in New Jersey, Hilton Head in South Carolina, Brunswick and Savannah, Georgia, as well as Jacksonville and Miami, Florida. And a lot of times I, when we talk about and think about Florida, we don't think about a problem with water, but there certainly is. Groundwater pumping in the Tampa-St. Petersburg area has not only led to saltwater intrusion, but subsidence in the form of sinkholes. And we've all seen these on the news. Uh, it seems like Florida is plagued with them, and they're big ones. And sadly, one gentleman lost his life who was in his bed in his bedroom, and they still haven't found him. In order to reduce its dependence on groundwater, Tampa <coughs> has constructed a desalination plant to treat salt water for municipal supply. And so many times I, I get the response that, why don't we just build desalination plants and use that 97% of our salt water. <clears throat> well, take a look at that plant. This plant was built in 2008 at a cost of $158 million. It was designed to treat 25 million gallons per day. It's never done that. It usually runs at around 60% capacity. Desalination plants are huge energy hogs and huge money hogs, they're not the answer. Well, they are one answer, but not a good one. South Florida is <clears throat> losing its water wells as seawater intrudes into the Biscayne Aquifer. Salt water has already moved six miles inland in Broward County and is likely to continue to creep westward. 90% 90% of South Florida gets its drinking water from underground supplies, most of those from this Biscayne Aquifer. This inland movement in Broward County is due to urban pumping from that Biscayne Aquifer. Several areas in the Gulf Coast <coughs> Plain are experiencing effects related to groundwater depletion. Groundwater pumping by Baton Rouge, Louisiana increased more than tenfold between 1939 and 1970. This pumping caused groundwater level declines of approximately 200 feet. Baton Rouge is underlain by a series of aquifers. The large water level declines have resulted in salt water encroaching from the Gulf of Mexico into several of the aquifers. And as you can see on the slide, the red is the salt water intruding into the uh, fresh water where we see those wells and in some cases the wells are contaminated can't be used any longer. In the Houston area, <coughs> Houston, Texas area, extensive groundwater pumping to support the population growth has caused water level declines of approximately 400 feet. This has caused land surface subsidence of up to 10 feet. This subsidence is also responsible for increased susceptibility to flooding, and some areas are permanently inundated with water that weren't previously there. So you can see the subsidence around a well where the, where the ground used to be, but how about that picture on the right? That's the San Joaquin Valley, 1925, 1955, 1977. That's almost unbelievable, isn't it? 
that the land has subsided that much. They pump a lot of water out there. Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Tennessee have been pumping from the Sparta Aquifer since the 1920s, causing significant water level declines. These declines have caused concerns about the Sparta's sustainability. The Sparta Aquifer has been declared critical in Arkansas. Memphis, Tennessee, and West Memphis, Arkansas, is one of the largest metropolitan areas in the world that relies exclusively on groundwater for a municipal supply. <clears throat> Excuse me. Pumping in this area has caused water level declines of up to 70 feet. Tennessee and Arkansas are now concerned over continued and increased pumping in the Memphis area. The Ogallala Aquifer is one of the world's largest aquifers. It underlies an area of approximately 174,000 square miles, including portions of South Dakota, Wyoming, Nebraska, Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Texas. The Ogallala has been intensively pumped for irrigation and water levels have declined more than 100 feet in some areas. And you see uh, below this picture, I say western Kansas where the hard red, or hard red winter wheat is grown. <clears throat> this is a common picture there. This is a common picture in the Panhandle of Texas as well. Since 1864, <clears throat> groundwater has been the sole source of drinking water for about 8.2 million people in the Great Lakes watershed. <clears throat> This long-term pumping has lowered groundwater levels by as much as 900 feet in the sandstone aquifer underlying the Chicago areas and eastern Wisconsin. Recently, it was thought that this pumping was affecting the surface water in the Great Lakes, and a reduction of groundwater pumping was imposed. <clears throat> Increased groundwater pumping to support population growth in south central Arizona has resulted in water level declines of between 300 and 500 feet in much of the area. Land subsidence was first noticed in the 1940s, and since then, as much as 12 and a half feet of subsidence has been measured. Historical photographs have documented a loss of streamside vegetation as a result of lowering the water table. A 2013 study of 40 aquifers across the United States by the U.S. Geological Survey reports that the rate of groundwater depletion has increased dramatically since 2000. USGS reports that almost six cubic miles of water per year is being pumped from the ground. That compares to about one and a half cubic miles average withdrawal per year from 1900 to 2008. February the 17th, 2015, press release from Denver, Colorado, and I'll read it. On Wednesday, February the 18th, the Colorado House of Representatives Agriculture, Livestock, and Natural Resources Committee will have a hearing on House Bill 15-1167 concerning the development of new water supplies for the growing areas of Colorado along the I-25 corridor from Colorado Springs to Denver to Greeley. Section 1-4 of the bill states, and I quote, assess the feasibility of constructing a pipeline to import water into Colorado from the Missouri River Basin. That's my water. And in fact, the proposed place that they were gonna plant this pump was just north of my home in Kansas City, between Kansas City and St. Joe. That's 650 miles they proposed pumping water. And do they know that's uphill? <laughs> Dallas area to Phoenix, 863 miles. Dallas area to Albuquerque, 575 miles. So, could they take your water? Well, it's tough. It's tough when you cross state lines, especially. 
but the Dallas area to the Texas High Plains is only 300 miles, and it's in the same state. And if they take a lesson from California, they absolutely could do that. Well, <laughs> this is the Vista Ridge Pipeline. How many know about the Vista Ridge Pipeline? Yeah. It's a, uh, this is the map of the proposed pipeline that will deliver 16 billion gallons of water annually from underneath Burleson County to San Antonio, about 140 miles away. Uh, that's monitored by the uh, San Antonio Water System, or the SAWS system. So they know how to do it already. Who owns the Texas groundwater? Unlike surface water, groundwater is the property of the landowner, which allows a landowner the right to capture the water beneath his or her property and sell, lease, and move the water pumped from his or her property to a neighbor, a corporation, or a city. Historically, groundwater has been governed by the rule of capture, or as some people in Texas call it, the law of the biggest pump, which allows a person with legal right to the groundwater the right to pump whatever groundwater is available, <clears throat> regardless of the effects that that pumping may have on neighboring water wells. Texas courts have limited the rule of capture to some extent in order to prohibit the landowner from doing the following, from pumping water for the purpose of maliciously harming an adjoining neighbor, pumping water for a wasteful purpose, causing land subsidence on adjoining land from neglecting, ne negligent pumping, uh, drilling a slant well that crosses the adjoining property line. State of, State of Texas legislators have passed several laws that curtail groundwater pumping. Uh, three major restrictions have been imposed to prevent unlimited pumping of groundwater. It can be found in the Texas Water Code, and these restrictions are pumping water that comes from the underflow of a river, pumping groundwater from an aquifer within the jurisdiction of a groundwater conservation district, and remember I said there's 99 of them in Texas now, or pumping groundwater from the Edwards Aquifer within the jurisdiction of the Edwards Aquifer Authority. So this is where the groundwater conservation districts need to come into play. Yeah, it's your water underneath your ground. But if we aren't careful, it won't be there. Um, the future of on-site and how our industry can help this problem. We can be part of the solution for groundwater depletion. 22.5 billion gallons of fresh water is pumped from aquifers per, for personal use every day. Let's just say for argument's sake, all 86.5 million homes in the U.S. were using on-site systems instead of going to municipal treatment plants. It would recharge the aquifers at a rate of 22.3 billion gallons per day. Wow. If all of the homes in the United States were using on-site systems, we would solve the problem. Today, on-site systems are being used on 25% of the homes in the U.S. That's increasing as new construction occurs. And we are currently recharging the aquifers at a 5.6 billion gallon rate per day. But unfortunately, 75% of the homes in the United States are sending 16.7 billion gallons of wastewater to the oceans every day, to the oceans every day. So am I worried about them contaminating the oceans? Well, yeah, I am, but I'm more worried about our freshwater turning into salt water, our groundwater turning into salt water. Household distributed wastewater recharge. What we need to do is work outside this room. We need to educate people outside this room. And to do that, we need to know how much recharge can we get? Is it safe? And what does it cost? 59,000 gallons of wastewater per year from showers, toilets, faucets, and clothes for a family of four. The study done by McQuillan and Bassett in 2009 
found that 85% of that wastewater recharges the groundwater aquifers, or 50,000 gallons per year recharged per household. This was done in New Mexico where they get a lot of evaporation as well. Is it safe? Well, if you read this flyer from the EPA, they say decentralized wastewater treatment is a sensible solution. So let's do the math. 917,000 single family homes, the National Association of Home Builders predicted to be built in 2016. Approximately two thirds will be on central sewers. If all the new homes built in 2016 used distributed or on-site wastewater system, there you go, 86.3 billion gallons per year would be recharged to our aquifers. Some of you may have seen the study done by Jessica Katz in 2014, uh, where she compares um, in three different ways um, centralized sewers to decentralized or on-site. Uh, the embodied energy, uh, the embodied carbon, and the raw cost. And you can see uh, the red being centralized sewers, the green being on-site, the great advantage that on-site has. The cost reduction of 68%. Saving 216 million gallons of gas per year. So I like to put this slide up here. That's, those tanks are 50 feet high and 50 feet in diameter. You could fill them 300 times. Wow. If we save that amount of carbon, it would be equivalent to creating over a million acres of forest each year. That's what it would take to process that amount of carbon emissions. So it would be like creating a forest in the United States each year that's the size of the entire state of Delaware. Incentives to use distributed infrastructure or on-site wastewater. Now that's the incentive right there. Are we going to do it? Probably when it costs $5 to take a shower. So I put these few slides in here to show you kind of the state of the industry and how our industry is misunderstood by big pipe. I spoke in the state of Washington about uh, two, let's see, two years ago, I think, and I did some research in the state of Washington, which is a, um, uh, they're very mindful of their, of their ecological systems out there, and they have some beautiful streams and lakes and, and, and mountains, and they take good care of them. Uh, so, Take a look at some of these clippings that I dug up. Roger Brown, general manager of the Birch Bay Water and Sewer District. Existing regulatory regimes are not adequate to ensure that on-site septic systems are properly constructed and maintained. I agree with that. Even under the best of circumstances, moreover, septic systems will ultimately fail with consequent risks to environment and public health. Are there misunderstandings by our industry as well? Yeah, there sure is. There sure is. Some, some in our industry still don't believe that our systems can be the solution for the life of the home. Representative Larry Springer from Washington. Aren't all these systems just temporary until sewer becomes available? These people still think that. Steve Lindstrom from the Snohomish King Water Sewer District. Look at the long-term trouble-free service that sewer provides compared to periodically having to maintain, rehab, and pump out, et cetera, of an on-site system. Now, is he saying that sewers don't need to be maintained and rehabbed? It sounds like it, doesn't it? Look at the long-term trouble-free service that sewer provides. I put that in yellow because I want you to remember it when you see something a little bit later. Patrick Sorensen from the Whatcom County Water District. Septic systems almost always fail in time, unlike maintained public systems. He forgot to put maintained septic systems. 
because maintained septic systems don't always fail in time. There is limited to no enforcement by counties or health districts in the inspection and maintenance of such septic systems. In addition, when such systems leak, they typically pollute groundwater sources in an urban environment. In our situation, our sewer infrastructure surrounds Lake Whatcom, both the district's and Bellingham's drinking water source. Zoe Fraley from the Bellingham Herald, February the 25th, 2014. People who draw directly from Lake Whatcom urge to boil water. Sewage leak after generator failed during power outage. People who draw their drinking water directly from Lake Whatcom are being advised to boil their water before consuming it after sewage leaked into the water during a power outage Monday, February the 24th, according to the Lake Whatcom Water and Sewer District. Patrick, I bet Patrick read that. Septic systems almost always fail in time, unlike maintained public systems. Remember what Steve said, look at the long-term trouble-free service that sewer provides. I dug this letter up, and I'm going to read it to you. I don't know if you can read it there, but I can hear. This is from, if I get a little closer, Jim uh, Bellati, section manager of the Water Quality Program, Washington State Department of Ecology, referencing the City of Spokane Combined Sewer Overflow Annual Report, calendar year 200, 2013. Combined Sewer Overflow. So, do we know what, do you all know what that is? Basically, it is when the municipal plant can't handle the inflow because it's too much, then it overflows raw sewage into a receiving stream. So it alarms me that they even have a name for this, and it even alarms me more that they have an annual report for it. But more than that, read this. Enclosed for review and approval is the City of Spokane's 2013 Combined Sewer Overflow Annual Report as required in Section S13B of the City's 2011 NPDES Permit. The 2013 Annual Combined Sewer Overflow Volume to the River of approximately 39 million gallons is near average. This report will be posted within a few weeks to the city's wastewater management website. Septic systems almost always fail, unlike maintained public systems. Look at the long-term trouble-free service that sewer provides. Is this really over 106,000 gallons per day? Raw sewage going into the Spokane River? Yes, it is an average of 106,000 gallons per day. That's sad. 